Rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome everybody to Florida Faith Church, a fresh expression of church with a new energy, taking risks for the sake of the gospel. I am Pastor Marcos for all of you that are joining us online, and this is the second week of Advent. This is, I know, yeah, we can thunderous applause for that one. This is the time when we wait in expectation for the Christ child, and we're going to hear a lot about that through the message today. But I want to extend a special warm welcome, not only to those here in our waterfront sanctuary, but those that are joining us online, and especially those military personnel that are joining us from abroad and our expatriates. We love you. We're thinking about you. We're praying for you. And uh, we may even see you home here at some time uh, in the near future I hear. Over these last few weeks of Advent, I've been thinking a lot about how scripture compares our relationship with God to that of children and a father. And since Daniel and I are new parents this year, that analogy is hitting really different. And one thing I've been especially aware of in this Advent season is that children, especially babies, do not like to wait. Our daughter, at least, she doesn't like to wait to be fed, to be held, to be changed. And her needs seem to be the most immediate thing. And when she doesn't get what she wants, she cries a lot. And as her parent, this is hard for me because I know her real needs and I know that I'm doing everything that I can to try to care for her. Even though she seems upset with me, I know that I'm the person right now who can do the very best to take care for her. Scripture tells us comfort Comfort my people, says our God. Speak tenderly. Bring me your wounded hearts. For earth has no sorrow the Father does not see. And this next carol that we're about to sing was written during this social tension that was rising right before the Civil War. And as we sing together amidst the chaos of 2020, may we do so as children singing to a Father who promises to care and comfort us. Touch their harps of gold. 
The Old Testament is full of stories. Fascinating, true stories that capture the imagination. Brutal stories of war, revenge, and violence. Tragic stories of betrayal. And endless stories of God's power, His love, and His faithfulness. And every story points to a promise. A Savior is coming. Things will be put right. Don't give up. God gave Isaiah a glimpse of what to wait for. A people walking in darkness see a great light. The war is over. The victory celebration begins. How? A child is born. A son is given. A leader will finally bring peace and justice forever. And so the waiting began. And this is Advent. This is what that whole season is about. Waiting in expectation. And today our big question is, are you prepared? It's a pretty profound question when you think about it. And we've been doing a lot to kind of prepare for this season of Advent. We just finished a uh, sermon series called Undivided. And I know most of you here saw it, and hopefully online you saw that. And if you didn't, um, you can certainly engage in that on all of social media. You can see those things. Um, it's a great series, and it is a series that we did in conjunction with 100 plus other churches in South Florida, um, more than a dozen different denominations, and thousands of people received that same message across South Florida, and now that is rolling out across the world. And the idea is that we as Christians are undivided that Jesus unites us to each other and with all this craziness going on in the world and we're not just talking about a COVID pandemic and the politics going on and, and just life in general, but on top of that now we're gonna stack the Christmas holidays. And for many of us, that's very exciting, but also for those same many people that are preparing for those, for that, it can be pretty stressful just figuring out the Christmas holidays, and especially this year, in what we're gonna do and how we're gonna share that with each other. And it's important that we understand that Jesus unites us for a purpose, and that, that purpose is to demonstrate love in and through each other and to each other. That we are all called to the same miss mission, to serve each other. That whole love thy neighbor thing. As a demonstration of community for God's kingdom, that we live on earth through God's kingdom. And so really the message throughout that undivided series was that what unites us is far greater than what divides us. That Jesus is our great uniter and his church, we are an extension of him. So here we are in the second week of Advent already. How many Christmas trees are up? Mine went, okay, so yeah, 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 up, yep, yeah. So mine went up, and um, I, when I was a little kid, uh, our Christmas tree rotated, and it sang songs. Yeah, it did. Well, and so I, last year, I said, that's it. I got an eight-year-old, right? She's eight now. But last year, I said, that's it. My tree is, I'm going back to my childhood. My tree is going to rotate and say, well, it's not going to sing. I, I put the you know, radio on in the back. My tree's going to rotate. So it was great because last year it rotated. It was awesome. And people come in the house and they go, is that tree spinning around? I said, yes, it is. And you can even put more ornaments on it. And so this year I pulled my tree out of my box and put it in there and did all the things. It was covered in things. And I think I have a little blood on my arms because it fell this way and that way. And, and uh, my eight-year-old is not helping me. And my wife just looks at me with, you know, like, you, I'm not coming close to you. And I get the tree up and I plug it in and the lights go on. 
and it doesn't spin. So the tree came down, because my tree is spinning. That tree, that tree gonna spin. So it went down, thing went back in the box, boom, fat, my tree now spins. It spins, I went back, got a new one, the tree is spinning. So I am getting ready, I am preparing myself for the Christ child, and that's one of the things I'm, I am doing right. And in Advent, we're focusing on expectation and the anticipation of Christ's birth. It's the season leading up to Christmas. And Advent is a direct message, make no mistake, to you. This is God speaking to you as an individual. It is a message that's based on faith, a message of where God is calling you in your life to be prepared. It's a big question. Mentally, physically, spiritually, are you prepared? Well, God sent somebody to prepare the way. His name was John the Baptist. And what's interesting, we're going to talk a lot about John the Baptist today. Pretty good looking guy. What's interesting about John the Baptist is that we had not heard from God, God's people had not heard from God, and you know how long? Over 400 years. God was silent. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, boom, John the Baptist shows up, and he is announcing that the Lord is coming. He appears before God saying, repent, prepare the way for the Lord. That's a big job. So what do you think if John the Baptist were here today and he sat down one-on-one -on -one with you, put the seat right in front of you, and you're sitting right there, and he looks you right in the eyes, what would he say to you? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this worship service. Thank you for this time together. And we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of everyone's heart is pleasing to you, O Father, our rock and our redeemer. We pray that all of your messages here, whether spoken or unspoken, are received and enjoyed by everyone. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ and all of God's children say, amen. Yeah, what would he say to you? So it says the, the word of God came to John in the wilderness. In the wilderness. I got to tell you about a buddy of mine. I lived in, uh, <laughs> when I was an undergrad, I went to University of Arizona. Uh, we're, in, we're in Florida if you're watching. Go Cats! When I was at an uh, undergrad, University of Arizona, and I lived in the Delta Chi fraternity house. Yeah, I see a lot of people going, well, that explains a lot, right? And in the Delta Chi fraternity house, I, I had a, a buddy, we called him Lurch, and he was a, a big, big man. And we called him Lurch because we nicknamed him after this guy. Anybody see the Adams Family? Are familiar with the Adams Family? He even spoke like Lurch. And in fact, Lurch... My buddy, not only was he my fraternity brother, but he was my pledge brother, meaning we went through pledges to work our way to become active members together. And Lurch was one of these guys that would say anything. And you know, when you're a, a young man of between 18 and, let's see, I was in college till, uh, I think I'm still there. <laughs> Right? But when you're in college between the ages of 18, 22, 24, 25, however long it, it takes you, right? you're pretty sensitive. And at 18 years old, when I meet Lurch, he's a guy that would say anything to anyone. He was one of these guys that was very abrasive. And I knew if I was hanging out with Lurch, no dates were in my future, because he just couldn't talk the talk. He was abrasive, he was confrontational, he just spoke his mind. He could not get a date. I don't think he even showered very much. And 
he did say things that actually helped me quite a bit. Because Lurch had this, this interesting talent. He could see right through to someone's soul. And in my experience with him, he was, he was right many times. And, and I'd start to hang out with somebody because I wanted to be cool. I wanted to get into the house. I wanted to be part of the clique. I, you know, I moved from Colorado to Arizona. I didn't know anyone, so I want to be part of that cool crowd. And I'd start hanging out with someone, and Lurch would go, Marcos, man, that guy's a... And he was right most of the time. And in doing that... He saved me from a lot of hardship in my life. He could spot the storytellers. He could spot the guys that were going down the, the wrong paths. And in spotting them and saying, Marcos, do not hang out with this guy because he's that. I did not. And so God saved me from certain experiences in my life. By the way, one of our pledge brothers, Pete. I really like motorcycles. Lurch said I shouldn't get one. Smart idea. Pete died in my arms on a mountain. I was driving a car. Pete wasn't. It's amazing what God saves you from. He sends messengers. Our Bible reading this morning is from Mark 1, and it's all about a messenger that God sends. And I love this because this is in the beginning. And when we're talking in the beginning, what Mark is talking about here is that Isaiah, a major prophet, has predicted, this is Old Testament, has predicted that God is going to send a messenger, that he is going to send a Messiah. And here comes Mark, and he's telling us about it. And he's telling us about the messenger for the Messiah. And it says, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. Okay, so as I mentioned before, God has not spoken to his people in 400 years. We've talked about that before. God is not happy with what is going on for those 400 years. And God goes, you go. See how you do. I'll keep my mouth shut. And 400 years later, here comes the prophet. Behold, I send a messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness. Wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. And then John appears baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance. John's not a soft-smoking guy. He's like Lurch. He appears and he says, repent. For the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Next slide, please. Now John was clothed with camel hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locust and wild honey. No Thanksgiving dinner for John. And he preached, saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals are not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. What does wilderness remind you of? I mean, this guy shows up in the, in the wilderness I mean, wilderness, to me, brings images of this barren wasteland, this deep, maybe untouched forest. Maybe wilderness for you could be an absence of civilization, wild beasts. Could be the beauty of nature. How about danger? 
When you think of wilderness, you think oh, there's something dangerous out there, the, the unknown, the unexpected, some sort of adventure or something. Well, when you meet John the Baptist, as soon as you, you run into this guy and you're wearing your robes back in biblical times, I mean, I would go, whoa, what, who is this? You knew immediately when you ran into John the Baptist that something was different. And not only something, someone. He was different from everyone. I mean, clothes, a camel hair. Anyone ever have a camel hair jacket? My dad did. And when it used to be the cool thing, he wore a camel hair jacket, like suit jacket. But when it rained and he walked in the house, he went, Dad, you stink! And a leather belt, which means probably homemade, probably twisted it up to, to tie around the camel hair or something to, to keep all of his stuff together. And he's eating locust and wild honey. I mean, what is this guy? I mean, imagine what he smelled like, what he looked like, what his breath was. I mean, come on. I mean, he probably would have done awesome on Survivor. But he wouldn't have made it through Survivor because he would have been voted off. Do you know why? Because in Survivor, you got to be caring about the others and you got to play the game. But John had none of that. Nothing about caring, nothing about sharing, nothing about family, and I'm going to give you a warm hug, nothing about singing Christmas tunes. He was definitely not a salesman. He's not selling you anything. He's not convincing you of anything. He's not out to do that. He is a messenger of the Lord. And many times the messages that the Lord sent, send us do not give us those warm and fuzzies. He's not a sweet talker. He's no way a politician. He, he's not interested in popular opinion. He doesn't care about what people say or think about him. Kind of sounds like Jesus Christ, doesn't it? And his message, if you met him, would rock you to your core. It would hit you right in the heart. Have you ever had anyone like this in, in your life? I mean, you speak to these people, you meet these people, and for some reason, you don't know, you may not even like them. But their message will just rock you to your core. And you go, God, that, that, that guy just sees something in me. That lady can speak into my soul. I'm not sure why. I'm, I'm not even comfortable. But I know that when I'm with that person, that person makes me a better person. Or that person speaks into my heart and soul. And I, and I leave. And I feel like I need to get closer to God. A person that breaks all the rules in your life. Maybe their words resonate with you. Who is that person? Have you ever met anyone like that? I mean, John was sent by God, think about it, to prepare the way for Jesus Christ, for his only begotten son, for the Messiah. That is a big job. I mean, what do you do? You, you, I don't know, you update your resume for that? What do you do? How do you, wow, it's a big job. I mean, he was prophesied hundreds of years before. God has not spoken to his people, and now he's going to speak to his people and say, I am sending the Messiah, and this is what we get? It's Advent. We're preparing, getting ready to celebrate the birth of Jesus. So what would it be like to meet John the Baptist? If John the Baptist sat across you, you're sitting at your kitchen table. I would first get a lot of coffee before this guy came over. A lot of coffee. He wouldn't get it, I would. I mean, what do you think he would say to you? How do we prepare for Christ? How are you preparing to meet your maker? And make no mistake, you're going to meet him. How are you getting ready? John the Baptist has words to share with you this morning. The first thing that John the Baptist would do when he met you is he would he'd pull his credentials out. 
John the Baptist. He would tell you that he has a special job. He would say that the prophet wrote about him years before. And in biblical times, people memorized the Bible. And for John the Baptist to say, the prophet Isaiah told you I was coming and I am here now. Those are some big words. And you know people like this in your life, they say stuff and you're like, yeah, right, whatever. But then the people that say it with authority, there's something different about them. He had this special job. It says in the Bible, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight the paths for him. His job was to prepare the people for the coming of the Messiah. Giant job. That's what John the Baptist would do if he talked to you face to face. He'd pull out the credentials. He would work on preparing you to celebrate Christ's birth. And he would be in your face. To prepare you for the second coming. His credentials? God himself sent me. And what would his message be to you? Would he tell you, don't forget about sharing and caring and loving as you prepare for Christmas? No. He he wouldn't. What would John the Baptist say to you? He would say, and so John came baptizing in the desert region, preaching a baptism of repentance. John would tell you, plain and simply, you are a sinner and you need to repent. Those are hard words. Just like that. I mean, think about it. Is there something wrong with you? There's a lot wrong with me. A lot. We're human. We are all sinners. We are not God. So yeah, we got a lot of stuff. I don't care how pretty your life looks on the outside, you got a a lot of stuff. And John would say, there's there's something wrong with you. It is time to repent. You are a sinner, and it is time to change. How would you respond? Huh. I mean, some of us would respond, what does this guy know? I mean, I'm fine the way I am. I I work hard. I wake up in the morning. I pray. I take care of my personal responsibilities. I'm not perfect, but I am okay. We are not perfect. Period. And according to the Word of God, if you are not God... (laughs) If you are not Jesus Christ himself, then you are not perfect, which means that you are sinful. Okay. That's what John the Baptist would say to you, and then he would follow it up and he would say, repent. And repent is what we all have to do. We have to repent for our sins. I I wake up every morning and I repent for my sins. And when we think about repentance, we say, well, how do we do that? And the first thing we have to understand in repentance is that we have to recognize that we are sinners. We have to be humble enough, put all of our pride, put all that stuff aside, and go, yeah, I'm a sinner. Totally sinner. Verse 5 tells us that in the first century, Christians 
said the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him confessing his sins. I mean, what was so special about this guy that he's giving you a message. He's telling all these Christians after 400 years, you guys are, you got to repent. And on top of that, they don't go, what? And the whole countryside, they're coming out to him in hordes of people are coming out to him and he is baptizing him and they are repenting for his sins. Think about the, how magnetic he must have been. And he wasn't even a nice guy. I mean, recognize your sins. Where have you been less than perfect in your life? Oh, I got a list of those. Look back at your conversations your daily conversations. Look back at the way that you have treated people around you. It is such a skill to be a proactive listener. Think about the relationship you have with God. Think about your thoughts. What do you think about, guys? Don't answer that, please. What do you think about ladies? Don't answer that. Please. Where have you been less than perfect? Recognize your sins and and confess to Christ. That's the first thing he would say when, when you repent. And the second thing he would say is, here's the great news. Receive the good news. Receive his forgiveness. Because he knew this. He created you. So receive that goodness, receive the forgiveness. Verse 4 talks about baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the Lord Almighty, here's the great thing about Him, He forgives all of your sins, all of your imperfections, all of them. And because of Christ, because He suffered and died on the cross, your sins are gone. And God holds no grudges. He doesn't bring up your sins once you repent and turn from them. He keeps no record of wrong. He forgives you completely and fully. I mean, isn't that gratifying? Caveat. Every other religion in the world except Christianity. He says, you got to earn your way to heaven. You better be a good person. In Christianity, here's the difference. We say, can't earn your way to heaven. Can't do it. Can't. You can't possibly be that good. There's no way. The way you are getting into heaven is through the grace of God, through His love. And so the people come out to John to receive God's forgiveness through baptism. Have you been baptized? If you haven't, we want to baptize you. We would love to baptize you. An outward expression of your inward relationship with God. So today, also, you receive the same forgiveness when you were baptized that you do today and every time you hear God's forgiveness spoken to you and every time you open your Bible and every time you pray, you receive that forgiveness. And finally, John would say for this repentance, you got to reform your life. And here's the great news about that. I love Christianity because you just hand it to God because there's no way I'm good enough to do this or have the energy to do it. Is you just hand it over to God. And he transforms you from the inside out. And the beauty of that is that you can't possibly do that on your own. That means that after you have been forgiven for being so impatient, (laughs) you start to become patient. After you have been forgiven for for having that bad temper, (laughs) you become gentle. After you have been forgiven for being so greedy, you become generous. 
After you have been forgiven for disobeying God and, and making excuses, you begin to obey God. Not because you have to, but because you have been transformed from the inside out and you want to. Because that is the person that you become. You change from this self-centered worshiper of pleasure when everything in your life is dedicated to that job, that title, that car, that house, that whatever it is, sex, power, drive, money, right? You change from the self-centered worshiper of pleasure to another people-centered worshiper of God. You love thy neighbor. So that final hour of, of repentance is when your life is, is reformed. It's changed from how it was before. You're transformed from the inside out. And when your transformation is flourishing and you start to bear this great fruit. Hey, that's great news, Pastor. Cool. So how do I do that? That's the big question. How do we do this? How do you find the courage to confess all of my sins? How am I going to do that, Pastor? That's great. I love your message. Awesome. Great. How do you think I'm going to co confess all my sins? How, am I, how do I know that I am forgiven? Great message, Pastor. Cool. I got it. And where do I find the strength to change and reform my life? Do you know what I am going through? Great questions. So let's ask John the Baptist that. After me will come one more powerful than I. The thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and unite. And he's making an analogy there. That's what slaves did. That was the job of a slave back then. And, and John is saying, I'm not even worthy to do that, of a slave touching this man's feet. John says, someone is coming, someone greater than you, greater than I, and he is the one that will give you all that courage to confess your sins, that knowledge to know that you are forgiven, the power to do so. He is the one who will take every single one of your sins away. He is the one who will strengthen you and change you and transform you into this new person and this new creation. That is how you know. And he said, I will baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Someone greater more powerful, more compelling, more amazing than anyone that has ever lived. Someone is coming. He is preparing the way. And that's what we're doing in Advent. He will demonstrate his power in all kinds of ways. He's going to do miracles. He's going to give you the, the gift of the Holy Spirit. He is going to resurrect the dead. Oh, and by the way, uh, if he didn't resurrect from the dead and he didn't resurrect people from the dead, Lazarus, we can all just go home. Because in preaching and Christianity is completely futile. Christianity is completely contingent on the resurrection. That's what it's all about. And then on top of that, he sends you the Holy Spirit and the gift of the Holy Spirit and faith and hope and love to you. One thing I've noticed through this pandemic as we're trying to figure out Christmas is people are sending me recipes. I'm like, really? <laughs> I, I got, if you're sending me recipes, I got a microwave and, and, and my wife, <laughs> right? Any recipe that comes to me, I in a, she doesn't let me in the kitchen unless it's the microwave, a couple buttons, and they have to be pre-programmed usually. That's what I can do. But they're sending me all these kinds of, of, of recipes. 
through this pandemic. I mean, there's a lot of these being shared. Eggnog. Okay, I will take a good eggnog and or sweet tea recipe. You tell me how to spice it up just right. Or a recipe for a perfect Christmas dinner. I mean, this is the time of year not only for sharing our love, but, but also our recipes. Now, I don't think Mr. John the Baptist had many recipes that he, many culinary delicacies that he would like to, to share with you. Or you'd even be interested in Unless, of course, uh, grasshoppers and, and wild honey you want on your, on your Christmas dinner. But what would John the Baptist say to you if you were to ask him, what is the recipe for a successful Christmas? What would he say? According to our text and who John the Baptist was, he would tell you there are two main Ingredients. The recipe for a successful Christmas is this. A heart full of repentance. Repent. Admit it. Recognize it. Receive the love of God. And a heart full of Christ. Those are the two ingredients that make up the recipe for a a successful Christmas regardless of your circumstances. And this is a tough year, man. Even if you are living out in the desert right now. And I know many of you are. And know that I am praying for you. If you are out in the desert with nothing to eat, But grasshoppers and wild honey, come to the Lord and know we're praying for you. It's Advent. John would say, prepare the way for the Lord through caring, through sharing, and family, and giving, and charity, because when you repent, that is who you become. And all of that stuff can't be truly enjoyed until you're First, understand that Christmas is a time for repentance, to fill your heart with Christ, a time for Christ. It's time to prepare and rejoice that someone has come. Someone has come that brings real meaning. Someone that is your Lord and my Lord. Someone's name is that is Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father God, you've called me to Advent. You've called me to this great adventure. You have called me to repent, to recognize my sinful nature, to speak that to you, to, to turn from my sins, to repent, to Receive your free gift of grace. And then step out on faith and be transformed from the inside out in my journey of sanctification. Father God, you've called me to a venture far beyond anything that I can even imagine. And I know you have a long-term plan for my life. And sometimes, Lord, I, I don't see that plan and I fight it. Lord, I'm here to be an active participant in Advent. Lord, give me the desire to serve you, the direction and the faith to follow you, to move into the the wilderness of adventure, of Advent that you have called me to and prepare my life, my heart, my soul for anything. The good, the bad, the love, And especially, an encounter with you, the risen Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone says, amen. Amen.
God called us to repent <laughs> and to plant this church many years ago. And here's the great news. We're here today, and we are celebrating our three-plus years of ministry. We didn't know how it was going to happen. We just knew God had us. And we planted a church. And the way that this church has continued to, to evolve and the way that we are sitting here and we are online with you and all of these resources have come together is nothing short of a miracle. Trust me, it is a miracle. We are truly in God's favor. And we thank you for your prayers, your gifts, your love. And now's the time to give back. We're at the end of the year. This is the time when we set up our budgets for 2021. And man, am I excited to, to look ahead at 2021 and kiss this one goodbye. <laughs> and so there's many ways of, of giving back. As we start to set our budgets, uh, many of you have received now a letter in the mail from me um, or an email, uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's about stewardship. And our stewardship program, here's how it works. We send out letters to everybody and we say, hey, how much do you plan financially on contributing to the church this year? And we ask you to send back a card. And it just simply tells us, hey, I plan on contributing more or less this amount, right? We'd like a solid amount, but this much week, month, quarterly, or whatever that's going to be. And then we take that and we put it in a budget and we figure out what we're doing in 2021. That's how it works. It's not rocket science. And that's what we're doing now. So please, when you get those letters, please return that card back to us. Send an email back so we can go through that budget cycle and determine what that is. There's many ways to give back to this church. If your financial resources are, are not the way you're giving back, if you're, if you're giving back, we need your time. Wow, do we need your time. And we need your effort and your talents, especially in this upcoming Christmas season, right? We have a lady, I'm really excited about this. This is the first time we're going to do this. We are sending a whole ton of cards to prisoners in jails to say, Merry Christmas. That is so cool. That is how she is giving back to this church. And now is the time to give back. There's three ways you can give back your financial resources. Uh, we don't do anything here in the sanctuary. When you walk out, there's a box in the back. You're, you're welcome to contribute there if you're one of those. Um, if not, you can text the word faith, give to the number 77977. You can give any amount. If you're online, if you're on uh, Facebook or any of our social media, uh, especially if you're on our app, uh, click on that button on the bottom, click on give, and you can give that way. There's many different ways that you can give we give because God gave first. Let your kingdom come to our streets and to our sidewalks. Let your will be done in our pride and in our shame let your kingdom come to our homes and to our families let your will be done for the sake of your name in all our violence and our fears 
up all of these things, saying the prayer that you taught us to say in unison, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Padre nuestro que estás en los cielos, santificado sea tu nombre, venga a nosotros tu reino, hágase su voluntad en la tierra como en los cielos, danos hoy nuestro pan de cada día, perdona nuestras ofensas como también nosotros perdonamos a los que nos ofenden. No nos dejes caer en la tentación y líbranos del mal. Amén. 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 The second week of Advent, our first one is hope. The second week is, is peace. And so today as you go into the world as we are sent from this place, before you respond, as you're reflecting on yourself in those individual exchanges, how you act, how you are, who you are, and how you are preparing your heart for the presence of God. Think about that and then move forward with your day and with your lives. Until we come back here again next week or you meet us online or at one of our Bible studies or events. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may he give you his grace and his peace and his love And you're going out and in your coming in in your lying down and in your rising up, in your labor and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears until that day in which you come to stand before Jesus in which there is no sunset and no dawning. Go in peace. Amen.